in this very last lecture of Physics 1D, we're going to take a grand view of the universe, including the uh, stars and galaxies, as well as the evolution of the universe as a whole. Of course, because of the time limitation and uh, the mathematical background that we have, we can only have a very crude look into this, uh, this matter of astrophysics. But uh, nonetheless, the results that we can obtain already is fascinating, are fascinating, and you can see a lot more if you pay more attention into it. And uh, astrophysics is pretty much divided into two parts. One is uh, the uh, study of uh, stellar evolution and so on, basically uh, how celestial objects behave, when they come from, how they evolve, how they die, and so on, such as our sun. And the other is the uh, physics of the entire universe, how the universe evolves, and that is called cosmology, including the famous Big Bang Theory and so on. And there is a connection between the world of ultra-small and the world of ultra-large. And again, that's only in physics we can do that. Astrophysical, uh, astroparticle physics actually uh, is a branch of astrophysics that uh, strives to uh, understand the connection between these two very different worlds. For example, we can study nuclear synthesis, and that is wh where do the uh, uh, nuclides come from? Helium, hydrogen, and, and the heavier ones, where do they come from? And uh, what about the evolution of uh, particles and their interactions? For example, uh, the electric weak force and the strong force and so on. If you look back in time, were they that distinct as we know today? Were they different in the past? Those are things we study in astroparticle physics. So we're now uniting the world of very large and the world very small. And we're also expanding our, uh, our scale of time. We are looking back into the beginning of the universe. So this is the ultimate theory that will encompass our study of the entire reach of space and time. Now, for celestial objects, we're going to use our sun as an example. We're going to look at some interesting aspects of solar physics. First of all, the solar structure. The sun has different layers. And uh, what we can see, the visible part of the sun, is a very thin layer called the uh, photosphere. The photosphere has a temperature about 5,800 Kelvin, which is not very large. And above the uh, photosphere, there is a layer of so-called chromosphere, and it's at a higher temperature, 15,000 Kelvin. And even above that, there is yet another layer called corona. Corona has very, very thin density, so uh, it, there are not many particles in there. However, it's got an astonishingly high temperature of 200 million Kelvin. Okay, I don't have the time to, to study. We don't have time to study any, any of these details, but uh, it's interesting that this is the 5,800 Kelvin. We'll see the next page how we get that. And also at the core of the sun, that's very important. At the core of the sun, the pressure is really high because the gravitational pull of the sun is so much greater than the gravitational pull at the interior of the Earth due to the enormous mass of the sun, which is about 2 times 10 to the 33 kilograms. Okay, 10, 2 times 10 to the 33 kilograms. You compare that with the mass of the Earth, which is of the order of 10 to the 24. There's a huge difference. And the temperature in the interior is about 150 million Kelvin, 1.5 times 10 to 7 Kelvin. And this temperature, at this temperature, uh, the matter inside is plasma, not neutral atoms. And uh, this is where the nuclear reaction, nuclear fusion goes out. And that, as you know, is the energy source of our sun. Now, let's focus on the photosphere for, for a moment. If we measure the uh, radiation from the sun against different uh, wavelengths, we will find this yellow profile, that is the actual measurement from the, 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 the radiation from the sun. The most intense radiation is somewhere here at around 500 nanometers, which is visible. Not only is it visible, it happens to be the yellow color of visible light. That's why the sun looks yellow. It's because the predominant radiation the most prominent radiation is the yellow color of visible light. OK, now this profile resembles quite closely to 
a black body radiation profile if the temperature of the surface of the black body is at 5,777 Kelvin, or roughly 5,800 5, Kelvin. So therefore, uh, using a, a, a black body at surface temperature of 5,800 Kelvin will give you an excellent approximation to the, uh, the uh, radiation from the sun. And uh, this is why we say the surface temperature of the sun is around 8, 000, uh, 5,800 Kelvin. That explains the color of the sun as well. It also explains the total amount of energy radiated from the sun per second. That is the power of the sun, otherwise known as the luminosity of the sun. You know, if it's a black body of a certain surface temperature and certain surface area, we can find out the total amount of power radiated. That is the so-called uh, Stefan Boltzmann law in black body radiation. Do you recall that from uh, chapter 40? Okay. If we assume the sun can be approximated as a black body on its surface at this temperature, and we'll, of course we know the size of the sun as well, the radius, we can then calculate the luminosity of the sun to see if it matches the uh, prediction of the black body at that temperature. Well, the luminosity, which is the total energy output of the sun, it uh, can be measured experimentally. And the way we do that is this. Here is the Earth. Here is the sun to Earth. This is R which is also known as 1 AU or 1 astronomical unit, we can, calc uh, we can find that distance. And uh, at that distance, the uh, intensity of the, of the energy from the sun intercepted is called a solar constant. It is 1.36 times 10 to the 3 watts per meter squared. That's a famous solar constant, about 1,400 watts per meter squared. And if you multiply this, that's the you know, intensity, which is power, emitted, power intercepted per unit area, multiply this by this large the by the, uh, the area of this large sphere because everywhere on that sphere the intensity will be the same so i times a a b and four pi r squared a r is one au or 1.5 times 10 to 11 meters which by the way is the same as eight and a half light minutes which is the distance traveled by light in eight and a half minutes okay one astronomical unit which it turns out that the luminosity of the sun is 3.85 times 10 to the 26 watts Okay, that's all the magnitude, 10 to the 26 watts. And on the other hand, if we approximate the sun, we model the sun as a 5800 Kelvin black body, then we can use the Stefan Boltzmann law to calculate the, uh, the, uh, uh, the luminosity, which is the Stefan Boltzmann constant sigma times the surface area of the sun, which is uh, 4 pi r sun squared times the surface temperature to the power of 4, remember, Stefan Boltzmann law. We can calculate the intensity of the sun or the luminosity of the sun, depending on whether we divide by the area of the sun or not. We know what sigma is, and then we, w if we did that, we can then trace, we can go back and calculate the surface temperature of the sun, and it turns out, yeah, we do get 5800 Kelvin. Okay, so if you assume, again, the surface of the sun to be an 8500 Kelvin black body, you can not only understand the profile, you can also understand the total amount of energy radiated per second. So that's one aspect. And the other thing I want to talk about very importantly is the pressure and the temperature inside the sun. We can do an accrued estimation of, temperature, uh, of pressure. You, you can do some more detailed calculation, but you know the pressure near at the center of the sun must be gravity induced, right? It's the weight or it, it's, the, it's the mass that's attracting each other causing this, uh, this enormous pressure. And therefore, it must depend on the g, the uh, universal gravitational constant, as any gravitational phenomenon would do, it has to do with the mass and radius. The greater the mass, the smaller radius, and then the, the greater the concentration of matter, and therefore the greater the pressure. So it depends on those things. And uh, we can do a you know, um, order of magnitude estimation based solely on dimensional analysis. We can do that because these guys have different dimensions. So instead of using alpha, beta, and gamma, we can solve for everything. You know, that's kind of boring. So I have an easier way to do that. Just, you know, Pressure is force over area, right? Force, how about force? Using Newton's law of, of universal gravitation, g times mass of the star squared over radius squared, that gives you force, divided by surface area, 4 pi r squared, or just, you know, all the vector, just r squared. So looking at this expression, if you ignore all these constants, and that gives you 10 to the 16 Pascal. It's an enormous number compared with the... Uh, atmospheric pressure on the surface of the Earth, which is uh, 10 to the 5 Pascal, this is 10 to 16. Okay, now at this pressure, this is gravity driven, okay, will, 
hydrogen atoms as charged neutral atoms still survive? It, that is to say, will the hydrogen nucleus, which is the proton, able to hold on to its electron? Well, let's see. There is a force of attraction. Okay, is that force of attraction between the electron and the proton enough to to withstand this crushing pressure from gravity? Well, let's see here. We can calculate the sort of like pressure caused by the attraction between the electron and proton. The force in electron proton is like this: Ke squared over a. This a is the first ball radius. Okay. Now you 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 divide this pressure over the uh, surf sort of the surface area of the atom, which is four pi a squared. Then you get this number. Now this number turns out to be also very large, 10 to the 12 Pascal, but it's still a lot less than the gravitational pressure, which is 10 to the 16 Pascal. So the gravitational pressure will crush the uh, this alliance between the electron and proton in the uh, charged neutral hydrogen, and therefore we expect no charged neutral hydrogen to exist at the core of the sun. What we're getting will be a plasma. That is an even mixture of positive and negative charges. Positive charges primarily being proton, negative charge primarily being the electron. So that's called a plasma. What is the temperature of that plasma? That is very important because that can determine whether thermonuclear fission can go on or not by itself. Temperature of the core. Now the temperature of the core is a, is a, is, is a function of these parameters. Uh, of course, it has to do with the mass of the hydrogen because we're talking about you know, uh, mass of the proton because we're talking about pro a whole bunch of protons. The mass of each proton certainly matters. But then you have the mass of the sun. You have two masses, very different, but with the same dimension. Okay, we also have the Boltzmann constant, but that doesn't matter because that doesn't have a, you know, it has, a, has its own dimension. But the fact that we have these two quantities of the same units ruins the simplicity of trying to solve this problem with dimensional analysis alone. So we cannot do dimensional analysis. Instead, let's do an ideal gas law estimation. Why can we still use the ideal gas law? Because the ideal gas law is valid when you look at a relatively dilute gas, even though you have huge gravitational pressure. The mean density of the sun is quite small. It's only 1.4 grams per centimeter cubed, which is a little bit, li little bit denser than water. So because of that, you can still th think of the, uh, the particles as reasonably far apart, especially consider their huge kinetic energy because they move at very high speeds, uh, which can still be much greater than the, you know, the inter-particle potential energy. So therefore, the ideal gas law should hold relatively well, even at the core of the sun. And then we use PV equals nRT, and this n is the number of moles of protons. Okay, then we, we, that is equal to the total mass of the proton divided by the mass of the uh, uh, divided mass of uh, of each mole of, pro of, of proton. So from that, uh, we can calculate P, which is nRT over V. So let's 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 or, P, or, or the temperature, which we really want to know, PV equals NR, PV over NR. This is the pressure, which we calculated a minute ago. Volume of the sun divided by the uh, number of moles of hydrogen in the sun. That's a total solar mass divided by the mass of each mole of hydrogen, which is, uh, as you know, it's uh, one gram. We're talking about hydrogen nucleus, okay, or proton, just about one gram per uh, per mole times the universal gas constant R. So you do all this calculation. Okay? You do all this calculation. I, I have only kept the order of magnitude pretty much, except for that two here, which is the mass. This is from the mass of the sun. And you do this calculation, you find that you are looking at two times ten to the seven Kelvin which is a reasonably good approximation because the actual number when you do a more careful calculation is 1.5 times 10 to the 7 Kelvin and uh, this gives enough temperature for proton-proton cycle of nuclear fusion and that is the energy source of our Sun. So again let's examine more closely the source of energy from of, of our Sun. If you think of the Sun as just a hot sphere of gas, okay only, uh, you know, uh, no nuclear fusion, only just a whole bunch of, you know, very fast moving protons and electrons. They have a lot of kinetic energy, at least for now they do, because the temperature is very high. And as they gradually cool down, they can give off energy, right? So that's only the thermal radiation energy with no nuclear fusion. Okay, if that is the case, then at today's radiation rate or today's, today's uh, luminosity, 
how long can the sun's energy last? Well, we can do a little estimation here. This would be the total energy of the sun only from its thermal, uh, thermal radiation of the particles. That's number of the hydrogen atoms in the sun, total number of hydrogen atoms, uh, or total number of protons in the sun, I should say, times kT, right, roughly. I mean, it's like three over two kT, but who cares? Roughly, that's order of magnitude. Okay, this I can rewrite as the number of moles of hydrogen in the sun times R, because uh, Avogadro's number times k is the universal constant, constant R, so that, that's how you, you do that. And then the number of moles of hydrogen in the sun is the total mass of, hydro, uh, of the sun divided by the molar mass of hydrogen, which again is about one gram per, per, uh, per mole times RT, okay? Uh, well, T is some sort of average temperature of the sun, but let's be generous. Let's say every part of the sun has the same temperature of 10 to the seven Kelvin. So we're overestimating this energy a little bit, okay? We let this be equal to the luminosity of the sun, which is the power emitted at the sun, from the sun times the time it takes to for all this energy to dissipate that will give you the age of the sun how long this luminosity is going to last and if you did this calculation only in order of magnitude you find it's 10 to the 17 10 to the 15 seconds now each year is about three times 10 to the seven seconds so that translates to about about three times 10 to the seven years so that's like 30 million years which is nothing 30 million years Okay, life has existed on this planet for much longer than 30 million years. Much, much longer. And life, of course, depends on energy from the sun. Therefore, this is a serious underestimation of the energy of the sun. Why? Because we have ignored nuclear fusion, which is the actual source of the energy of the sun. So take a look at the real source, nuclear fusion. N at the center of the sun, the core, the temperature is high enough so that proton-proton cycle can go on. These are some of the equations that I wrote before for the proton-proton cycle. So you start with proton, eventually fuse into helium, and so on. Every step releases energy. The total amount of energy released is roughly 0.3 to 0.4 percent of the rest energy of the, of the, of the initial protons. And uh, each step would release some signature particles like the uh, like the uh, uh, neutrino okay so this step you see neutrino and this this is the first step and second step there are some another there's a few more possi possibilities from this point from this point on from the third step on there are a few branches like four branches as you saw in a previous uh, previous chapter but each of these will release a certain type of neutrino and there are different types of neutrinos and all these neutrinos at least most of them would just escape the sun and just go everywhere, including neutrinos that reach the Earth. And this gives us the only clue about whether this whole theory is right or wrong. And then we look at that clue, we look for the number of neutrinos that we were supposed to be detecting from the sun in relationship with the power emitted from the sun. The greater the amount of power, the more neutrinos have to be emitted because the greater the rate of uh, nuclear fusion, right? And here's the problem. And the problem is, when we calculated the neutrino production rate based on this mode model of proton-proton cycle, if we, it turns out that if we want to explain the luminosity of the sun, which is about 3 times 10 to the 26 watts, we would require neutrinos to be observed at a far greater rate, more than twice the rate of current observation. This is called the solar neutrino problem. There is a discrepancy between what we have observed and what the sun is supposed to be producing if this model is correct. So this could mean that this model is not correct, something else is going on, but it could also have alternative explanations such as neutrinos may have a mass, a rest, small rest mass and so on. So this is still an open question. What is the solution of the solar neutrino problem? One of the more interesting uh, possible solutions to that problem, even though a little bit radical, was proposed by the, fam uh, the famed Stephen Hawking. Hawking believed that at the center of our sun, there may be a mini black hole, a small black hole. And this black hole sucks matter into it. And basically, it, it's, it accelerates particles into it. As these particles accelerate, they, they release energy through radiation. 
and that is a new source. It is not nuclear fusion. It's a new source which supplements the energy from nuclear nuclear fusion, and so that explains why the nuclear fusion has can undergo in, in, at a small uh, lower rate, and you still produce this much energy. But that is only one possible explanation, and the, the solar neutrino problem hasn't been completely resolved. Now you can use the uh, uh, the uh, thermonuclear fusion idea to estimate the actual age of the sun. It's way beyond 30 million years, obviously, the actual lifespan of the sun. Assuming that 1.1% of mass is converted into energy. Why do we use that assumption? Well, it's the correct order of magnitude, okay? Now, if you do the proton-proton cycle, you find actually you're looking at about 0.38% conversion. But not all the matter in the sun is converted into, into energy through nuclear fusion because nuclear fusion only goes on when the temperature is high enough and you know at the surface of the sun for example that that never happens so the matters near the surface of the sun will never undergo fusion so we're looking at about a smaller rate let's say 0.1 percent estimation order of magnitude okay so this much mass of the sun eventually turns into energy before the sun dies so looking at delta m which is which is per one percent mass of the entire sun that's the mass of the entire sun all this matter turns into energy is multiplied by c squared. That's how much energy is emitted, divided by the rate at which energy is emitted at, at, at the correct rate, which is uh, which is uh, four times about four times ten to the twenty-six watts. And then what you're getting is how long this energy emission going to last in seconds. Now we convert seconds to years, and the answer is about five times ten to the nine years, or five billion years. This is the crude estimation. Okay, don't believe that five that much. A more detailed calculation shows that the age of the sun can be around is about 10 billion years. That's the lifespan of the sun. It's about 10 billion years, okay? And it's believed that the sun has already uh, gone through about 4.6 billion years. So it's got a little bit more than half of the life left. So on a human scale, the sun is middle-aged. Uh, the sun is about 40 years old on a human scale. And this is true for not only for the sun, for many other stars, so-called main sequence stars. Most stars are on the main sequence stars, and they typically spend about a, about 10 billion years on uh, on the main sequence before something happens and before they they start to die, which we'll talk about.